Good morning, folks. Good afternoon. Good evening, depending on where you are. And also, depending on whether you're watching this live or on a rerun, you could be listening to this just on a podcast site because I am on your favorite podcast site. So you can download and have a listen while you're driving and all that kind of stuff. Um, big shout out to sponsors Summer Cable, the bestest ever. Chicken Picks, bestest ever. ET Guitars, they're cleaning stuff. I'm going to do a really cool video soon, restoring a 73 SG I've got sitting over there using some of Ernie Taylor's new cleaning products, which smell heavenly. There's so much you want to eat it. But there's somebody lurking around outside. Ding dong. Who's that? It is Simon Gardner. Hey, Simon. How are you, mate? You're on the Sunshine Coast. Uh, I am indeed, in, in the Noosa Hinterland, yeah. Noosa Hinterland, while well, I'm on yeah. the Gold Coast. So if anybody uh, doesn't know the geography of Queensland, Australia, I'm about an hour south of Brisbane, and you're about an hour north, yeah? Uh, about an hour and a half, yeah. Nice. Yes. So, so we both yeah. live in really nice parts of the world. They are, yeah, yeah. very beautiful. Yeah, and you're in your little man cave, I see, mate. You were telling me you got a, a dedicated room there. Yeah, well, at this time last year, it was just a shed with snakes and spiders and a computer and a couple of speakers and my guitar amps. It was pretty, pretty um, Spartan. But um, yeah, we basically, me and a, a really great mate of mine, we uh, decked it out. So now it's just a, a great little workspace. Yeah, nice. got a really good vibe, and it's awesome to um, awesome to have somewhere to work. I mean, wow, yeah. The difference is huge. It is. Yeah. As I was telling you earlier, mate, this is my lounge room. Um, and being an ADD kid, I need everything set up and ready to go when I get inspired. So I quite yeah. literally, this morning, I turned everything on, made myself a coffee, sat down, and you were right on time for a bit of a sound check and everything. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, no headphones, no echo. Yay. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Simon, way back in the early 90s, you were one of the first guys I saw up close shredding the whole three note per string rolling out of your fingers style playing uh and you i believe you just come from a stint at the musicians institute at git i want to go back a little bit further and ask you what started your love of the electric guitar mate um yeah my my initial attraction to music was um uh drums but because of the volume of drums and uh, the uh, practicality, drums just really weren't practical uh, to have at home and to to play because of the volume and all sorts of stuff. So you know, the um, at school they send out you know, would you like to learn an instrument? Sign up here. So I thought, oh, we'll sign up for guitar, and um, I pretty much from the word go just loved it straight away and. Um, it uh, yeah, I, and I've loved it every day since. I haven't liked it every day since, but I've certainly loved it every day since. Uh, but uh, it's yeah, it's and it's it's. I don't know. It's a difficult question when you've been playing for so long. More of your life you've had with it than without it. it it's just sort of uh, you wake up with it either in your hands or in your head every day. You go to sleep with it either in your hands or in your head every day. You're hearing songs when you're out running in the forest. You're hearing, you know, when you're driving your car. Yeah, it's just, it's sort of, I don't know, it's almost like a whole state of being, really, I think. For me, anyway. Yeah, anyway, yeah I, I, I'm, I'm very, I feel very blessed to be able to have that. But awesome. maybe it's, maybe it's a, a type of divine madness, I don't know, but <laughs> hearing music all the time, yeah. And, yeah. and you said drums, you, you, that was your first attraction. Yeah, most definitely. Um, I, I still remember um, Explosive Hit 74 and um, there was a very famous British drummer called Cozzy Powell and he had a big hit. He had an instrumental hit on this pop album which had um, the Lardy Dars and all sorts of people, uh, the Hollies, yeah, all the big people of those of that, of that era. And, um, yeah, he had this instrumental tune called Dance with the Devil on it, and it was Cozzy Powell. And he was a very, and he also played with uh, Richie Blackmore's Rainbow and that. In fact, he, he's got my, one of my favourite drum fills of all time is the intro to a, uh, this massive tune called Stargazer um, by um, Richie Blackmore's Rainbow off the first album. It's just 
so good. It's just so enormous. And um, yeah, so that was kind of my um, my first attraction, I guess. Just you know, also being a boy, being about ten years old. Yeah, you know, there's something quite primal about drums. I think. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. so. I've found that um, most people that are musical, that are natural musicians, can play the drums somewhat. Yeah. It seems to be one of those things that if I was to ever have auditions to have a second guitar player in my band or anything, I think the first thing I do is actually give the person a set of drumsticks and just say, play me some time. Don't, don't want to hear any fills because that's, that's a learned thing. But mm. playing time is some people just have it and some people work many many years to try and develop it and there's still just something missing so I yeah. think it's, it's a great starting point did, did you ever actually keep at the drums enough to be able to play with bands or anything like that or did you no graduate? no, no, it, no it, it started um yeah but it, it started and ended pretty quickly the the next door neighbor at my grandmother's house he was a guitar player and played in bands in Ital in the italian clubs because my grandmother was italian so we used to go to the italian clubs the boccia club and that sort of stuff and he'd be there playing and uh, he was a really fine guitar player his name was danny and um he uh yeah and he kind of i remember hearing him play and he's saying to me you should play guitar or, or drums or whatever and i said oh drums looks i love the look of drums to draw drum kits all the time so used to love the look of these drum kits especially heavy metal kits with two kicks and extraordinary you know like alex van halen yeah all those all those guys in the 80s and 70s that just the prog kits and that you know that it's just overblown like i loved all the the aesthetic of that yeah you know, really over the top um but yeah, anyway, I still remember hearing my electric guitar. Electric guitar for the very first time was at this guy's house um, in the flesh. The first time I'd ever heard it in the flesh, and it scared the scared the shit out of me. Really, it was so loud, and it sounded like an animal. It was like, and he said, "Here, do you?" Because he said, "Do you do you, do you play?" And I said, "Oh, I've just started lessons." And I just had a little nylon string that I borrowed from the next door neighbour. I didn't even have a guitar. And um, he said, "Do you want to play?" And I just went, "No, no, I couldn't do that." <laughs> oh my god, that thing was like a wild animal. And and you know, you play all the rock stuff and that, and play when you play a volume, as you know. It is like a wild animal that you have. It's like holding back these wild stallions or animals or something with this your guitar. It's, I love that now, and um, it does scare me a little bit still because of the, everything everything at high volume is is just mag magnified. Obviously, yeah. so any little mistake, anything you do well, any anything that happens is wow. It is like they're tearing people's faces off. You know, yeah, yeah. I. That's why you're always trying to do good things with good tone. So people, you know, the pain is it's like a pleasure and pain at the same time, I guess. So, um, so yeah, but anyway, that, that's, I, I remember that, 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 uh, and I remember the guitar too was this black thing. I don't know, I don't know what it was, but it was black and it looked like the devil and the sound was like a wild animal. And I remember being scared to death of it, thinking I might get electrocuted or be killed by it. And, but still, when I started playing it, it was like, you know, maybe a, a year later or something, it, it was like, it's just wild. You know, it's just wild. And it still is to me. It's just wild. When I see great guitar players and when I'm playing li live and loud, I just, I just think, man, that's just, uh, yeah. You feel like you're tapping into something very special. Yeah. Absolutely. Man, it's funny just talking about the, the sheer volume that we play at when we're allowed yeah. to, when we're not playing the small ones. Uh, I had a few different amps here recently I was trying out and my flatmate doesn't play guitar. And um, I had it down really low and he, he came in and said, oh, you, you can hear that out, out the front door pretty loudly. <laughs> and I said, mate, it's okay. I've, I've checked with the neighbours and you can hear it in the hallway, but next door or downstairs, they, they can't hear it. Even when I have it this loud, and I turned it up to probably about the level that we would play on stage with a loud drummer. And his eyes just, he was just this, what the fuck? <laughs> I don't think he'd ever been in the presence. And that, that exact thing that you said about being yeah. scared of, of the volume. Of just, oh, yeah. Whoa, whoa. Yeah. 
Yeah, it is. It's, uh, yeah, it's it's a full on thing, and in a way, you know that that thing at volume and hearing. That's why I love I love playing with amps and performing with amps. Uh, like I love all myriads of gear. Like I, I love the digital stuff. I love the Sims that you can get now. Uh, I'm playing through one now. You know, it sounds it sounds fantastic. Um, but there's nothing like playing through an air, a valve amp loud and the way that the air moves out of a guitar speaker box and the resonance that happens yep. and the way your jeans move when it's pushing air and you stand in front of it, like that sort of thing is just quite uh, quite primal. You know, uh, yeah, really does does amazing things to your body chemistry, I reckon. Absolutely, you know. absolutely. Yeah. Well, just, you know, they yeah. say vibration – uh, is the key of everything. And I, I was just watching some YouTube videos on, oh, what's, what's the, the science called? Cymatics or something like that. Just where they they run um, frequencies through plates that have sand on it and all the patterns that form and everything. Yeah. And man, that's that's fascinating. Um, yeah. What some of the, the three-dimensional shapes, especially when they do it on water that gets created by sound, yeah, man, yeah. there's something going on there. There's a technology we yeah. don't understand there, and yeah. I, think- well, I, I mean, it might be urban urban legends, but I, I remember um, again back back in my very formative years back at school and and seeing concerts for the first time and reading about bands like Deep Purple and and um, Motorhead. I think might have been the loudest band of work at the time, or they just defeated Deep Purple as being the loudest band of all time. <laughs> and I'm thinking, you know what? And that just really, I found it really compelling. Like, what could that mean? Like, what would happen? And then you read, yeah, you, know, you read something about how, how some punter has crawled into one of these giant W bins and died because it was so loud because of the bottom end, like oh, crushed. Wow! It. Like just the over the top stuff. Again, I don't know if it's just an urban myth, and if it's not urban myth, then whoever, someone out there might actually know that person. Yeah, it's not funny if that happened, but. If it is urban myth, it's a bit nuts. Like, you know, it's so, so sometimes it's like, <laughs> I know I play the Angels and Oils show and, and seriously, I've had my AC30 dimed at that show and I've had the boogie on stage and you're setting up at Tally Surf Club or somewhere and there's like kids in front of you just sitting there having lunch and you're going, oh, my God, there's just <laughs> this, this, my amp is quite possibly going to kill this child. <laughs> You know, I, I actually remember going to right. Twin Towns to, oh, okay. to see John English when I was about three oh, or yeah. four years old. Yeah. And yeah. when it started, I'd never heard a PA cranked before yeah. and thinking it was going to hurt me, like you were saying about hearing that guitar amp cranked up. And I can remember just thinking, oh, why isn't anybody running from this? You know, like, yeah. and sort of after a while going, realizing it's not going to hurt me. Ironically, my friend Pete Lyons ended up buying um, that PA. And when I was playing in the Queen show, that was the PA that we were playing through. And I used to stand you know, in, in my wig and everything as Brian May doing the whole, yeah, yeah. bitches. Um, and in the back of my head, I'm, I'm having this little giggle thinking, this PA I'm standing on was that PA that, I was, that scared the crap out of me when I was about three or four years yeah. old. So and it sort of come yeah. full circle. Yeah. yeah, full circle. Yeah, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I remember seeing the first concert I ever went to was uh, a Robert Plant um, at Festival Hall in Brisbane, um, and uh, that was in 1983. And that was his Principal of Moments tour that he did straight after um, – well, not straight after, but that was his first thing after Zeppelin. And I remember seeing that, and he started with that head he had at the time called I'm in the Mood, and it started just with the synth drone. They just got louder and louder, and the subs were like, and I'd never heard anything that loud, and my whole body is starting to vibrate with this sub. And exactly like you said, why, why aren't people running out of here screaming, going, my God, and yet there was something really quite pleasurable about it and quite, ex- like, incredibly exciting about this sound just washing over you and you it's almost like it puts its arms around you and says you're, you're here now yeah and you're staying yeah I, I've, um, I, I was very fortunate uh, in recent years to play in the Queensland Pops Orchestra and um, at some at some points that orchestra is 120 piece on stage like it's huge and just being a little guitar player they're comping away with chords um, 
The strings do that. The strings, I, I could just be sitting there trying to read the chart and all of a sudden this sound sort of creeps across like a mist and then just from the string section and then just puts its arms all around you and just like holds you there. And I, I'm just like, oh, like every, it's almost like everything's going to be all right in the world. In the whole universe, everything is all right right now because mm -hmm. this this sound, you know, amazing that 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 thing yeah that sound man that that's it I, I don't know how to describe it i guess it's a bit like talking about colors but um yeah i suppose that's why as guitar players we get just obsessed with tone um and gear and um which is a very funny thing in itself um yeah but anyway <laughs> so speaking of gear mate when you first started playing did you start out on a um, on a classical guitar or acoustic guitar first, yeah. and then graduate. Yeah, yeah. It was it was it was in those days where they'd still call classical guitars gut string guitars, <laughs> not nylon string. So they go. The next door neighbor is like, "We've got a gut string guitar here. Do you want to do you want to use it?" Because our next door neighbors were very good musicians. They played in a very popular band in Brisbane at the time called the Furious Turtles. Really, 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 and, and this is early 80s, and I was pretty young at the time. And, um, yeah, so cat gut, cat gut, yeah, gut strung guitar or cat gut strung guitar, so nylon string. Yes, yeah. and that's what I used. And my first guitar was the Suzuki 3S, which I still have. I still have here. And um, that's like a Martin D28 copy thing that my dad bought for me for about $145, I remember. And... Um, and I played that for a few years and then got uh, my first hollow body or first electric in grade 10. And that's a Tirada, which was they used to make guitars for the Ibanez um, at the Fuji Gen factory. They used to make guitars for the Ibanez custom shop. So this this Tirada I've got is kind of like a George Benson guitar. And because uh, I was getting lessons from this guy called Rick Purdy, who I always talk about, and he was an incredible influence on my life. Um, uh, particularly since it's the life I've chosen. So I, I, he's never too far away from my thoughts or comments, particularly while I'm teaching. Um, but uh, he, used to imp he used to import these and go there and sell them to his students. So I guess it was another stream of his income. But cool. he used to do all these sort of, less, these, these sort of um, lawsuit-type guitars and sell them. So there'd be 335 copies. And uh, I think Hoggy might have, for Powderfinger, he, he had the same teacher as well, Rick Purdy. Um, he might have got one as well. He might have got a Kasuga or something like that. Kasuga Les Paul. I think we used to call it Lay Paul in those days. So Kasuga Les Paul. Mine was a Tirada. There was a Hondos used to be very good as well. So these were really good quality guitars, but they were a fraction of the price of the American ones at the time. So, uh, and probably better at the time too, because none of the American guitars were any good in that time, you know, between the 70s and early 80s. So, um, so yeah, so... But basically, yeah, I started on acoustic guitar. I always recommend students start on acoustic guitar. I think it's just a very beautiful experience to be able to generate your own tone. And from a pure improvement and technical point of view, musicality point of view, um, an acoustic instrument is probably the most honest thing you can ever play, mm. I think. You'll get out of them what you put into them. So yep. um, like all guitars, like guitar is hard, I think. Um, and, uh, and so any guitar is pretty honest, but... I think, uh, yeah, in particular, acoustic guitar. So just something very pure about it, and I'll, I'll always recommend it. But, you know, if a student has electric guitar, and they go, look, I've got this custom shop strap to get started on, it's like, well, you're pretty lucky. <laughs> I do see here. that. I do see that from time to time. Yeah. But, yeah, you've got to learn the campfire songs on, on the acoustic first and see whether it, oh, it, it, so. it is your chosen destiny before you – making the investment into electrics and amps yeah. and all that. I tell you, man, I, I, used to, I, I used to definitely believe that. And I was only talking to one of my uh, students at JMC yesterday about that. And, um, and she was saying, oh, you know, I've got a Mexican Strat and one day when I'm good enough, I'm going to get an American Strat. And I said, you know what, that's, that's, I just don't believe that at all. I said, if you really love guitar and you really are passionate about it, get the very best thing you can afford. Just get the thing that you love and want to play. Because I think it's, I, I don't think guitar is linear at all. There are components of our technique in that that, that you could say are linear. We, we measure stuff with a metronome or we, you know, 
but by and large, it's quite nebulous, you know. Um, so I think it's all about that passion and that dedication and process. And if you've got a beautiful instrument, how inspiring is that? Like, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you have a beautiful instrument if you can afford it? Like, how good are you ever going to be good enough? I don't know about you. Like, we've both been playing for a long time, and I don't know about. I, well, I've heard a lot of the guys that you you've had, you know, the the these stars on your show, and I've heard other interviews with them saying, "Man, I just some days I feel like a complete beginner," you know. So, so you're never going to be good enough, and yeah. that's that right. There is beautiful to me. It's yeah. just this process. And this way that you live is that you live with your music and with your guitar and expressing yourself. I just think that's perfect. You know? Absolutely. So, yeah. Absolutely. So, fraught with danger and challenge, but it's perfect. Yeah. yeah. So, so mate, at what age did you start playing in bands? First band I played, I did, I did performances at school quite regularly. So they were sort of little guitar groups or solo guitar pieces and things like that from about grade nine through to grade 12. Uh, but I didn't play any bands at school, uh, much to the uh, disappointment of my teacher. Um, so I was playing a lot of sport. Um, and then when I left school, I put my first band was a band called Ezra Pound. Um, and it was with a dude who, a uh, great singer, man. You know, this uh, – sorry, I'm going down a rabbit hole a little bit here, but – You're up, mate. We're looking for vocal uh, – for male vocalists for this – for the big stadium rock show that, that um, I'm co-producing with my good friend Mel Evans and um, uh, trying to find male singers who sing like they used to sing in the 80s now is like – is just – I don't know. Are they out there? You know, I mean, I, I, I work with Cam. I had an absolute joy and pleasure working with Cam Brown. I mean, Cam's fabulous, um, but he seems so rare. I just can't believe that he's that, that he's the only one who can sing like that, you know, whereas back in those days, it seemed like everyone sang like that. And so the guy in this first band, he started, we started playing, and I would have been playing this so badly, it would have been unbelievable, but... Probably, I don't know, they've even they recognise. I, I was probably playing something like something, something like that, but probably playing like you know, they go, they'd probably go, What's that? So, like, whole lot of love, and they're like, Yeah, whole lot of love, all right, you know, you're cool, and they're going into it. But he's singing, this guy, Steve, he was great, he was, he was so good, anyway. But age of about 17. Late seventeens, yeah. Okay. Then, I think playing bands. I think if I was to look back about things that I would like to change, um, uh, with the benefit of hindsight, is probably playing more in bands um, from an earlier age. I think just that interaction, um, and but also the um, the skills of listening. I I, I just think uh, the the most overwhelming thing I took away from GIT was listening and that's where I started playing more in bands and going to what they used to call live playing workshops where you just roll up, they give you a chart and count you in and off you go um, in a specific style. It could be a blues, could be a groove, could be a rock one, you know, playing uh, Welcome to the Jungle, could be anything, you know. Uh, and these workshops are fantastic and so they'd have a you know, drummer, bass player, whoever, all students put together Here's your chart, get it together, count you in, off you go. And uh, really, really good. But I love that experience of playing and the power of when a band is is playing really well, especially in rock, it's just electric. It's just, you know, and Absolutely. we all understand. Anyone who plays in a band and it's sounding good, that's we all get that, right? Yeah. So, but that uh, listening component, that, that is the biggest thing I took away from GIT, plus a few really beautiful but simple t- uh, practice techniques. Um, which has helped me all through my career, but that listening component, and that's the biggest thing I th- I see now um, that that is really lacking in a lot of students. They're they're able to uh, their technical proficiency is sometimes just off tap. Like whoa, you know they're playing polyphia and that they they couldn't improvise over a, a one four Dorian vamp for me. You know what I mean? Um, and they couldn't tell me what this scale is or what that is. Or, so the knowledge level is very low, but the, the technical level and the ability to mimic is very, very high. Like, and mimicry is important to a degree, but the listening and audiation aspect of it from a creative point of view seems to be 
this strange little void. There's nothing, nothing there. And I think a lot of that has to do with a lack of transcribing, a lack of uh, playing with others, a lack of, uh, you know, not having uh, a YouTube to play with, you know. Yep. Um, so I, re- I read something uh, Guthrie Govan just recently said, who's one of my all-time favourite guitar players, um, just about how he could never be an online guitarist, you know. And I love his spirit of performing. Like, he's a real performer. And I think you see a lot of YouTube guys, when they perform live, it's pretty awful. The, the sense of tone and volume and all of those things that happen when you perform live that you've got to manage, that skill set is not there. Mm. And, the, and if you're playing with a live drummer, he's not going to be like your uh, easy drummer or whatever. He's going to have shift in what he's doing. And that's yep. beautiful. That's yep. what humans do. Yep. So... Yeah, so anyway. I think another aspect of, of actually playing um, in a band as opposed to being a, a bedroom player is you have to play the whole song like yeah. you mean it from beginning to end. Uh, there is, I know, just teaching people, they'll, oh, yeah, no, I just skip over this bit of the song. I don't really like playing this. There's none of that if you're actually playing in a band. It's like, no, the whole yeah. outro for this goes for 32 bars and we're not going to just stop because. We have to play the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, totally, man. It's um, and and I'm definitely guilty of that too. Particularly in certain in certain groups over the years I've played with, especially playing music that I'm not engaged with, but I'm I'm out working with my guitar and probably lacking a little bit in professional attitude. Um, so going not learning pop tunes all the way through and that sort of stuff, getting lost, getting bored because I haven't learned it properly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you do. You've got to honour the tune. The tune. The music's always much bigger than us. Um, doesn't matter how good we think we are. I think you know we're always serving that music. We're always a servant to the muse, following the muse, serving the song. Even if you're at just trend the boards in a, in, a, in just a band, you know, do do your due diligence and learn learn your stuff and do your best with it. You know, yeah. so and really honour it. Because the thing about it is, is we easily forget, particularly when we become better at what we do, especially phys- uh, technically, I think we, we very easily overlook that a lot of the simplicity that we hear on the radio, all these produced songs that we hear, they, they're they not created in five minutes and they're not created by one person. They're, 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 everything that you hear is very specific. In fact, to the point, I think, particularly with a lot of pop music that's it's, it's almost childlike in its simplicity, yet they somehow make a tune out of it mm. for three minutes. Like yeah. how, how, how do people do that? You know, uh, that, that itself is a skill that's separate to a musician. That's that, that heavy producer thing, you know. Um, but I, I find that quite fascinating actually how that happens. I don't particularly like that music per se, um, general, that's general too, because I like whatever makes me feel good. Um, yep. could be anything. Um, so, uh, but yeah, um, so anyway, I don't know where I was going with that as usual. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah, I hear you, mate. Like that, the simple, the simple stuff. Sometimes when you're an accomplished musician, ego gets in the way and you don't right. want to be playing something simple because it's like anyone can do that. Yeah, yeah. but that's what people catch on to. Um, yeah. And it's, it's easy to get bored. Real- you, you said the word there, get bored. And yeah. I was talking to someone earlier in the week that plays um, with an, another local player who I have much respect for. And they said, oh, yeah, there'll be nights where he just plays the most amazing, you know, just right for the song. And then he's, But he said, then there's other nights where I can tell his heart's not in it and he just plays fast for the sake of playing fast and mm. it's like well that's impressive but that just didn't suit the song at all so that that yeah. simplicity is a, a hard thing to for the the ego to say you know what it's okay that's what the song calls for right now yeah. well I, I actually find it musically hard i mean being an instrumental guitar player um and one of the things i really love hearing are, are great melodies that is my thing that really sets my heart like i love harmony i'm a big, a big like chords are kind of everything well everything is everything i guess but chords are kind of everything in a way but that it's that melody if you can create a, a beautiful melody that almost is like like for me being instrumentalist my guitar is my voice so i'm always sort of thinking about the inflections um the vocal like i'm always learning about about vocal melodies particularly through some some colleagues of mine vocalists about rhythmic 
aspects of melody that, that you don't think about when you're a guitar player because the way that we've taught, the way we've learnt, um, is that when you're playing melodies, there's a definite uh, uh, phonetic phrase to the melody um, that's quite often overlooked as opposed to just where the notes are and where they sit. So it's sort of it's something a little bit bigger and a bit more a bit deeper, even with the simplest melodies. And the simplest melodies are by far the most potent melodies, the most memorable, but also by far and away the hardest to get right. It's it's that, it's that it's that it's that old country music or ACDC thing. Yeah, just three chords. Any idiot can do that. It's like well. You try. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it is not any idiot can do that. And that's kind of my point is that, you know, sure, some music is more complex harmonically or rhythmically than others, but to write great music is just really hard. It doesn't matter what your genre is. It is really hard, you know. Um, and each genre has its requirements that might, sure, might weigh heavily, more heavily in some areas than others, but that it's all music and it's all hard to do, yep. especially do it you know so yeah. Yeah. and just talking about those melodies um satriani is an absolute master of that you know a yeah. benchmark album like surfing with the alien he's not just showing you his trick bag straight up you know like okay i'm gonna take a solo here's i know this trick i know this trick no he's playing beautiful melodies and one thing that really impressed me about you mate is i remember a few years ago going to see you do a an album launch for an instrumental album of yours. Ah, yeah. And I was, I'd watched you for about a good 15 minutes before you let go with the whole shred thing. Up until then, you were playing beautiful melodies and just Thank knowing you. that you were capable of doing the stuff, which is impressive to some people. And some people just go, yeah, whatever. Um, but you really held back and it was at the right time, it was 15 minutes into the set before you even yeah. started doing that. Whereas yeah. I've gone to other concerts of uh, of guitar shredders and in the first minute, I'm thinking to myself, okay, I've, I've seen your trick bag now. Uh, is it time to go? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing else there to, to keep my interest. Yeah, so that's yeah. one thing that really impressed me just um, about your previous uh, work is the melody – came first which yeah. is great yeah 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 thank you um I, it definitely and that's definitely my goal like if i was to give myself uh uh sort of parameters to work with that's definitely one of them is to try and create melodies that you know just for me just really capture my imagination like um but are simple it, it's uh yeah it's it's I just find it incredibly challenging to do. And all the great players that I look up to, guys like Satch and, and um, Steve Vai, um, Eric Johnson is like, yeah, um, uh, in all genres. I mean, my first record was an instrumental record by a band called Sky. Um, and that's uh, I still listen to that music now and I still love it. I still, uh, even apart from the, the nostalgic thing, uh, which I actually don't do that well. So even if I've got stuff that's nostalgic, I listen to it so much that it's not nostalgic anymore so I can get rid of that nostalgia because I don't like it. I'm not good with that melancholic nostalgia stuff. So, But I love hearing that. I love hearing the, the – ins- it sounds very inspired, which, again, it's like, you know, people talk about – I read – it might have been Greg Koch who was talking about Jimmy Page and he was saying that one of the things that, you know, in, in the 80s, I still remember people used to just slam Jimmy Page and Jeff Beck, right? They never slammed Clapton because Clapton was technically always such a great uh, technical uh, guitar player playing blues. And that's why a lot of the Americans didn't like him at first. The British loved him, right? Because they kind of reinvented the blues and they said, this is how it goes. And Clapton's technique was superb, like right from the early days of the Beano album all the way through. Um, maybe the 70s have got a bit weird. but um, the, And I went and saw Clapton live in the mid-2000s, and uh, he, he was superb. Like he was, his playing was accurate, timing, everything, how it should be. But Pagey got just smashed in the 80s. Sloppy, mm. everyone goes, he's sloppy. Yeah, he can write a good song. Like, like it's nothing to write a good song. Um, and I remember, because the 80s was Led Zeppelin. I mean, it's my soundtrack for the 80s. And I love Halen, but I love Sabbath and Zeppelin and Purple. Um, there's just a hardness to that sound. But their sound, 
what you could almost like when you listen to those recordings, you could almost uh, smell the amps tubes in the room through the recording. There was yeah. this, there was this energy about it that's electric, and it's very or this visceral energy that it had, and this inspired. So what they were going for was to capture something that was like this beast, capture it, and then give it to people. People listening going, well, what the fuck's that? You know, oh my God, what's coming out of those speakers? And I remember I, the first time I heard Black Dog, I was like looking at the speaker going, I just don't know what that sound is. You know, that fuzz, that metallic fuzz sound that he's got and that odd group, that chromatic odd blues thing, just going, what is that? But it's everything is different from now on. Mm. And I'd been listening to Charlie Bird, Joe Pass, even a bit of Al Demiola, all that early 80s prog rock and uh, prog jazz rock and fusion yep. from the 70s. And I got into that in the early 80s because Rick Purdy, my teacher, was a jazzer and a great guitar player. And um, and uh, so hearing heavy rock and, and the drums, that Bonham thing, and kind of just sort of blew my mind. But anyway, so we're going down a rabbit hole. Greg Cock was talking about Jimmy Page and he was saying that one of the things that so many people overlook and that is the pure magic of Page, take aside the technique and the, and the layering and the vision, is his purely inspired playing. And that's what he always went for with his recordings. And that's why they were never, or not, not never, but that's why you will hear weird stuff in there and go, what, what was that? And he's left it in there because he's gone, that sounds awesome because that sounds like I'm just about to fucking lose it, but I don't. And I, I'm putting it on there to let you know that that's how it should be. Cool. Um, I love that, you know, that's amazing to me. That takes incredible bravery. All the great artists do it. Um, they keep you hanging on the um, hanging on the edge going, Jesus, he's going to he's gonna lose it. He's going to lose it, you know. Oh, he doesn't lose it. Oh, that's heroic. You know, yeah. that's dramatic and heroic. It's just, you know. So, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, so, but, um, yeah, so, yeah. yeah Sorry, you mentioned mate. your, your uh, guitar teacher, Rick Purdy, there. What type of things did he teach you as opposed to when you went to GIT? Uh, was that like a big step again from the things you were learning locally? Um, not really. He, I think maybe this, again, sort of is a piece of the puzzle why um, I, I hold him so close to my heart. And obviously, because I'm a guitar player uh, now in my life, but um, is he taught me how, how to read out of the good old Hal Leonard guitar book. He taught us all how to do that. Hoggy was the same. And anyone who was there, Cam McKenzie, anyone who was there, they, they, like they, we all learned how to read. We all learned how to play jazz tunes. George Benson. We all learned how to play rock and roll. Um, you know, but rock and roll. I, I remember. I remember him saying, you know, we're doing uh, uh, you know, Stairway to Heaven and him playing it on this on this mate and guitar that had strings about as big as that, like just, and he'd be doing all that stuff and just going, and he finished playing the solo and he'd go, the master. <laughs> just shit like that. He's so good, but he'd go, yeah, that's a great solo, that, that, that Stairway to Heaven. And then, we, then we'd be doing, you know, You know, and he'd be going, that's a good solo, that one. You know, and so he picked the rock and roll ones that we could play and he'd show us how to play them and transcribe them. So he used to transcribe. Um, so they were wonderful things. So by the time I got to GIT, um, my theory was uh, the theory was not strong because I hated music at school and I didn't do it. I dropped out, and um, but I kept my guitar playing going um, and I could read even though I'm not a very good sight reader per se, I can read fairly fluidly. Um, um, what else? I had scale knowledge. Um, I, I still uh, didn't understand modes and what they were, but that didn't matter. I, I knew how to improvise because I remember Rick showing me my first scale I ever learnt was this. Like a G major in the, in the E form. And I, remember, I still remember this day, he go, all right, well, you play that scale. I go, yeah, play the scale. It goes, good. Now, I'm going to play some chords. You can play whatever notes you want to from that scale. And so he might have been playing something like that. Yeah, he might be doing something like that. And I'd be going... Yeah, 
just mucking around with these notes, any of them, because he said, "Any play them any order." And I go, "Any order?" He go, "Yeah." And all of a sudden, it's making music, and that I still that was pivotal for me because it was like, now I can just I can do anything I want. Yep. It's time to rock, you know. Well, in those days, it was like. That's great, man. <laughs> you know, all the major seven chords. Major giant. seven's got a lovely major sevens. That's a, that's a 14-year-old boy going, yeah, that's beautiful, man. Now I can just play a C major scale and just play all night long. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so good. And that I, I still I still love that. I still, you know, even working on stuff today, um, you know, new licks, new ideas, trying to work on things um, over the same vamp, so one four vamp, an A Dorian vamp. What can I do to this to reinvent it? Um, oh, the other day I saw, I heard this, I heard this violin thing the other day. I wonder what that was, and then try and work out what it was. You know, so just this creative uh, problem solving, creative, uh, ex- you know, experience on the guitar is. It's, I, I kind of feel like it's limitless, you know, and um, you know, it seems to me I'm not the only one, which is good because I was. For many years, I was really starting to think there was due to a very low intellect and very low level of talent on the guitar that I found it so hard. But the more as time has gone, the more I've realised that everyone does. <laughs> and that's okay with me. I don't feel like such an idiot anymore. Yeah. But the guitar, man, it just makes me feel like an idiot every day at some point. So, yep, yep. No, and, and as you said before, man, um, the – the big guys that I talk to all say the same thing that the more you learn, the, the more you realize that you don't know. Yeah. And yeah, that's, that's a big thing for me is I'm just sick of my own playing. And if I hear somebody that plays very similar to me, even that gets a bit, yeah, I, I can do yeah. that. And I'm sick of me doing that. Then I'll walk yeah. past a restaurant and someone's playing some flamenco or something and I'll just stop and go, what the yeah. fuck? Yeah. Wow. I, I, that's just so different to what I can do. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah definitely. I, I think um, you know the, the whole playing thing to me always, and exactly what you're saying. Uh, when people go, I'm really stable with my playing. The first thing I'll say is, well, stop listening to the music you listen to. You know, you've got to. Li- it's all about the music. It's actually not about your playing because your playing is serving the music. So if you can change what you're listening to, you will change the way you play. Mm. You know, because changing your tone is as easy as pressing a button. You know, it changing what you listen to. That's man. That's that's much harder because that's a bit of a shift. Because there are so many things attached to what we listen to. You know, there's this. It's this emotional attachment to, to this stuff. There's this. Oh, you know, that makes me feel good. It makes me subconsciously. We've got all these reactions to what we listen to. So if someone says to you, "Don't listen to that," you go, "But it makes me feel good." It's like, well, do you want to prove you're playing or not? Go listen to that. Oh, I don't like that. Go listen to it. Transcribe it. You know, yep. try different stuff. Then you start to, then then you'll get out of your rut. You actually start working on different things with your playing. If you sit down with your metronome every day and go, now I'll perform a country lick, fuck, man, so what? It's just your fingers on the strings. It's, yeah. you, you, it's that bigger picture. If you can get that to shift, then your playing will follow the suit because your playing is serving something else, it's serving something much bigger. So. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Um, now, Simon, yeah. we touched on the fact that you've got a new single coming out. And um, yeah. so I had every intention of actually loading it up and having a listen to it live and doing a live reaction to it, but I totally forgot about that. I didn't load it up, so I haven't heard it just yet. But no, okay. um, no. now I do it's- know that you've got Derek Sherinian playing keyboards on it. Yeah. How did Here's that come a- about? Oh, fuck. he's pretty average, I reckon. Yeah, he, he might he, he might go somewhere. Completely, completely sarcastic. I mean, okay, so the story about Derek Sherinian is quite a, kind of funny, really. Um, you know, in a in an ironic kind of way. Um, so, uh, so basically, yeah. So the single comes out next next uh, Wednesday. So uh, yeah, so you can get it. It'll be on all the Spotify and all that, and you'll be able to save your link on on Facebook and all that sort of thing. Uh, so all the streaming platforms. Okay, but how did Derek get on there? Okay, so Derek Sherinian to me was and is like a hard rock guitar player on keyboards, right? And he's, pl- I remember listening to an album he did. I forget, I actually forget the name, but it was so long ago, but it was around 
uh, the mid mid to late nineties, early two thousands, and he had Zach Wilde, Steve Stevens, um, who else? He even had John Sykes, who's one of my favorite guitar players on it. Um, all these heavy fuckers on this album, right? And he's playing keys, and I'm thinking, this guy, that is the benchmark. If you want, you want to call yourself, it's it's a bit like the Steely Dan story. If you were a guitar player and you went to an audition for Steely Dan, you got the gig, you could say you're a guitar player, right, if you're into that thing. And it was kind of like that thing for me, like imagine one day if you're good enough, you will actually know him and he, you will be on a record and there'll be some kid riding his bike out in the nudgy wastelands going, listen to this shit, like Gods of War with Zach Wilde playing on it, going, fuck, this is so heavy. This is just, oh, man, it's awesome. You know, it's giving me goosebumps. Awesome. And um, so anyway, we cut forward to last year um, around Christmas time. Um, I'm walking through Civic just with my two two youngest daughters doing some shopping, Civic, Musa Civic up here, just like shopping center. And... Um, I get a message on my phone and I'm just, I don't, I'm just cruising around. It's a Saturday morning, you know, I'm at about 50% pace. We're just getting groceries, hanging out. It's lovely, right? Having a coffee. And I look at my phone and it's an Instagram message from Derek Sherinian. And I've gone, put the phone back in my pocket. <laughs> and I just sort of walked up because he's still like to me, like it's just this guy, virtuoso who's A-list, you know, he's played with Steve Vai, Ingve. Everyone who I think is in the, the the pantheon of the gods of of, of hard rock and guitar playing, right? And uh, and my heart's just starting to like <laughs> do this. I beat so now my fifty percent's gone up to about seventy five percent. I'm going, fuck! Is that this must be some kind of mistake? Like you, had, you hadn't read it yet. So I'm taking it out of my back pocket. <laughs> the girl's like, Dad, what are you doing? I'm like, nothing. Be quiet. <laughs> and I'll put it back in my pocket again. It's like I don't want to read it. Like what? What? What could it be? Is what? What could it? What could it possibly be? It's Derek Sherinian. I know it's going to be like some sort of robot. Like some sort of robot. There's going to be some weird thing on it, right? So anyway, it's a message. So I'm going. It's a robot, right? Anyway, open the message. Yep, it's from Derek Sherinian. Hey Simon, how you doing? Are you still making music? And I've gone. Like, I was just confused. Like, this is Derek Shreddy. Like, you know, yeah, yeah. Just walking <laughs> through a new specific. Now, the rest of the world's just going about their business. A bit like War of the Worlds when the Martians first land and they're starting to do all their thing. And the rest of the world's just going about its business. Anyway, I'm just going, it's like War of the Worlds in my mind. And I'm going, fucking hell, this is Derek Shreddy. And I'm texting my wife, and, and this is kind of funny. It's like, Derek Shreddy has just messaged me. Derek Shreddy just messaged me. And she's come back with, who's Derek Shreddy? <laughs> <laughs> and you know what's funny is that most people that I say, and I stop saying to people, I'm going to have Derek Shreddy playing on my track. Because they go, who? Hey? Like, who are you talking about? Like, here, no one knows who the fuck he is. Whereas, well, not no one, but most people don't know who he is. Um, whereas in America, and that is, you know, he's the dude. But, um, so anyway, he said, and he said, and I said, and we had a little bit of a back and forth. And I said, I've always, you know, really admired you. I just think you're great. I'd love to, love to play with you one day in some weird sort of way. Um, uh, you know, how that could ever happen. I don't know how that would ever happen. And um, so he said, well, here's your chance. I'm, I'm doing, I'm, um, you know, I'm doing session work for people. And if you want, I'll play on your track. You send me through the track. And um, I'll let I'll let you know, and uh, blah 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 blah. We'll talk about money and all that sort of stuff. And um, so I've gone right. That's my goal for this new, which which, which has ended up being my new track. So I've, I've gone gone a demo. Um, for those guys who know me or work with me, kind of know I'll go. Yeah 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 yeah. Oh, this is terrible. Oh, I'm terrible. This is terrible. Oh, it's coming good now. This is great. Oh, it's terrible. It's terrible. It's terrible. And then I finally got to that point where I go, fuck it, all right, it's as good as it's going to be as a demo. I'm going to send it to him. It's not too bad. If he doesn't like it, what's to, what have I lost, you know? What have you lost? Anyway, so I send him the demo. He sends it back with full treatment. And he goes, this is, what, this is what I can do for you, full treatment. And he tells me his price list and all that sort of stuff. Um, 
and I've got and I've listened to what he's done, and I just can't believe that I've got a demo of Derek playing his stuff all over my tune, and uh, it's kind of just blowing my mind this whole process. And um, it uh, so basically, what happened after that? Um, I had to scrimp and save to get him to pay, play on the record, uh, and I also. Um, had the real like any time I can work with Darren Muller, Brisbane drummer. I, I'm just man. I love his playing so much um, in all facets. He's so musical, but he, he's great to work with. He's so pro as well. I can send him a track hit without drums and just with a click. He'll send back. We'll do a little bit of back and forth, but it's usually no more than three times. This time for this track, it went to the fourth time because it's a fairly complex track. Well, well, not complex, but it's not a super simple track. Um, but I was really particular about the vibe I wanted for it. Anyway, he sent me through this last one and we've, after back and forth and he said, look, I've fixed up what you wanted. Um, I've said, I've, look, I've just done another tape with some over the top stuff and I've listened to it and just gone, fuck yes, that's the one I want. Cause it, cause it had just had this energy, like, and that's, that's what I love. Like we keep talking about this energy and the vibrations and what he'd done on it was just so explosive and. You know, it's not it's not like a prog rock fantasy thing. Like it's not odd meter by the you know, but just his feels and the way he felt it and the fire in his playing, I thought this is great. So I've gone great. Send it to Derek. Derek sends it back with his tracks, and then I finally get it together, finish all my tracks, and then send it over to Dan Borowski who mixed it for me, and uh, yeah, and then we went from there. Mate, there is something really weird happening here. My soundbar on my TV has just started playing really loudly. I don't know why that is. I'm going to try and... Oh, it just stopped. That's did, the you, did you hear that in the background just then? Yeah, that's the energy. Derek's listening to us. Yeah, that was really weird. <laughs> if that, I'll go knock on my flatmate's uh, bedroom door if that happens again and go, Nathan, fix that. Um, man, isn't it amazing? Um, just how things like that can happen. Like you said, he just randomly messaged you, yeah, asking and you. I'm if you... Well, and I think it was. And then oh, obviously, in in uh, in in following time, I noticed that he was, you know, obviously doing sessions and that for other people as well. So, but I think the thing about it was was that I I, I didn't I, I I didn't reach out to him for it. It kind of wasn't on my radar. I knew I needed something for the tune, but having Derek Shireen like. That's not going to happen. Yeah. Wow. Like, how can you do that? Yeah. But he's messaged me. So I don't know. Maybe he was just really hard up for the work. I don't know, man. But uh, <laughs> I doubt it. But, you know, that's that. I, I just think it was quite serendipitous how it, all, how it all panned out. So I'll always remember that whole incident. But the result, in my mind, and for the whole track, actually, I'm so, so happy with it. I'm, and um, I did a brilliant, um, well, not I did a brilliant, I, I, I was part of a playthrough that was filmed by a brilliant guy called Adrian Golby. I, I don't know if you know Adrian. Adrian was a guitar player in Caligula's Horse till fairly recently. Caligula's Horse, awesome new metal band, uh, as a new metal I, band. I um, played with the drummer in the Absolutely 80s band. Oh, okay. Yeah. Josh, Man. yeah. Uh, yeah, fantastic band. Like uh, that, that stuff they do is super heavy. Anyway, Adrian's a really brilliant guy, um, but he's also. Um, uh, in general, really nice, really good guitar player. Also, it's felt film is this thing. Mate, I got that thing going on again. Let me try and work out what the fuck is going on there. That's a bit of Lydian dollar in action. Hang on one sec, mate. <laughs> All right. When in doubt, pull the power out. That was that was weird. I, when I woke yeah. up this morning, it started sputtering these little sounds at me. I was like, that's weird. I've turned off all the Bluetooth on everything. But moving right along, that's why people that's why people like to tune into a live stream so they can catch the train wreck. And that was that's a potential yeah. for one right there. Yeah. <laughs> I'll play a little bit of Lydian dominant action just as well, just as you would turn that off. So. Ah, nice one, mate. <laughs> nice one. But yeah, man. You must so, have somehow yeah, so, put that out into the universe for that to happen. Yeah, yeah, really. I, I think um, it, 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 it couldn't have happened in any other time. I think that's one of the things that's really obvious now that so many people are collaborating. You have the opportunity to collaborate with some of your famous artists. Um, 
uh, uh, favourite artists, I should say, um, people that you really admire. I mean, it's just kind of the way the world is now. And, and like what we're doing today, um, how, how I teach now is primarily online. Um, so it's, a, it's just, it's, you know, uh, it's just a very interesting time. Um, but for me, I don't know, it was just an opportunity too good to pass up. And a, and a good guitar buddy of mine said, man, because I was like, it cost a lot of money. I'm not going to say how much, but he was like, look, just do it. If you can afford it, just exactly what I said about guitars before. Yep. Just it's, it's something that you're going to go, you're going to have this great guy, you're going to have a great track. And then what happens after that? Well, it's going to happen after that. But yep. you'll have that. You, no one can take that from you. Mm -hmm. That is yours. Yep. And I thought, well, that's brilliant advice. So I just went yep. with that. And, and, some, um, and so, uh, yeah. somebody yeah. of that level, they just instinctively play the right thing at the right time, don't they? Like the, the parts you got back, you would have just been thinking, I would not have thought to have played that. Uh, yeah. It brings up something. I, I produced a record for my friend, uh, Brooke Supple, a couple, couple of years ago. And she wanted to give it a bit of a countryish flavor. And I'm no country guitar player. Um, and I can really hear it when guys fake a genre. It's like, it's one thing to play some country licks, but if you didn't grow up playing that, it's just doesn't, you don't know when to play it. And she was talking about, you know, oh, but Wazza says I should get Barry from Dubbo to play guitar on it. It was like, so what, what's he ever done? Oh, he plays a bit of country guitar. It's like, think big, think big. Um, and I remember saying to her, you know, like, who, who's the biggest country artist in the world right now? And she said, oh, probably female Carrie Underwood. And I'm like, why aren't you reaching out to Carrie Underwood's guitar player? Mm. And she's like, oh, as if, he, as if he'd play on my record. And I can remember having coffee and pulling her in closer and said, Brooke, I've got Carrie Underwood's guitar player waiting to play on your record. And she's like, what? And I said, yeah, I just simply asked him, Sean Tubbs, he's a YouTuber and you know, roughly yeah. know each other yeah. through that. You just got to ask people. You'd be surprised yeah. who'd say yes. Just like the guests oh, that I'm getting on here doing all, all this, these, these live chats, people say to me, how the hell did you get so-and-so? I asked him. <laughs> yeah. It's an amazing thing. And, and, and again, again, just this timing of everything and, and with the pandemic as well, like but we're a really resilient bunch, I reckon, musicians and artists. We, it's just by nature we are. And I think that, that we're finding, you know, like a lot of us, just finding new work ways to work. And the things that, in, that ex, 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 ensue from that are quite, are quite broad, hence me being able to have that. But, you know, what the right thing to play is an interesting thing because I think that's when you when you get someone like Derek to play on your record or your song, it's going to sound like Derek, and that's what I wanted there. So yep. I knew it was going to be right. Yep. You know what I mean? Yep. It's like, uh, yeah, so I, I, a good, really good uh, colleague and friend of mine, uh, a guy called Will Day, he's a country artist. And he said, man, I really like you. He's just released a song called Countrify, and it's pretty rocky country stuff. Anyway, it's really cool. Anyway, he said to me, I was lucky enough to play guitar on it, lead guitar on it. Um, and he said, oh, I want you to, my first reaction was talking about country guitar. He goes, my, uh, he goes, I want you to play on my track. Would you, are you interested? And I said, dude, I'm, look, I'm really not a country guitar player. You know, exactly like you said, like, I, I think there's nothing wrong with, with, calling in someone who's a specialist and knowing where your strengths are. I think that's a really important thing, you know, yeah. not to be able to go, oh, I can do everything. Um, like I play lots of different things, but I know kind of my identity. Yeah, you know what your strengths are. Yeah, so, um, uh, but anyway, so, and Will said to me, which is I took as the greatest compliment was, I, I want you to play how you play, but I want you to play on my track. And so he's saying, well, this track is pretty rocky. I need you. I need some, uh, need some cojones on this track, you know. And yeah. I was like, yeah, sweet. So, um, and so that whole process was, it worked out really well because of that reason. Because I wasn't trying to be like someone else. I was still had my rock energy and the vibe happening um, just with the telly, you know. <laughs> so yeah. to yeah. make sure it actually kind of worked with the song and took his advice, of course, his direction on it. So... Um, but yeah, that um, that I think that's a really interesting thing. I, I think uh, you know the whole idea of being a session guitar player versus an artist. The session guitar player is this highly skilled individual who can seriously cut many different styles. 
authentically. And there are people who can do that. And then there are the artists where you call them up to say you want them on your record because of the what they do. And I remember Jeff Beck was like that. Um, you know, John Bon Jovi was saying, you know, uh, what's that Jeff, uh, John Bon Jovi song? It was from a song. Uh, uh, bla- from- Blaze, of, Blaze of Glory. Blaze of Glory, right? Yep. Beck plays on that. And it's like, John, you could have any guitar player in the world. This is in the 80s. Why did you choose Jeff Beck? And it's like, Jeff fucking Beck. <laughs> It's like, you, you know, and any child, like, the thing is funny, thing, Jeff Beck, man, to me is just like, uh, he's up there. But he, he um, whenever anyone talks about Jeff Beck on uh, like No Guitar Is Safe podcast, I remember listening to all these episodes, Jeff Beck invariably would come up every episode. And anytime anyone would mention Jeff Beck, whether it was Jude Gold or whoever his guest, it'd just be this silence. <laughs> it's like Jeff Beck. Can't really say too much. Just, yeah. just say Jeff Beck, and everyone yeah. gets it. Yeah, um, and that was um, yeah. And I, I thought that's uh, that that to me is kind of like a that that's a brilliant thing. And so when Will asked me to do that to work on his record because he liked the way I did stuff, I nice. thought that that's a great. I, I really took that to heart. It was a great thing. Yeah, nice so, one. Nice one. Yeah, man. yeah. So, mate, as I said, I I. Uh, I didn't listen to the single just yet. If you were to describe yeah. it to me, how, how would you describe it? Okay. Um, well, the inspiration behind the single, uh, again, came out of a um, – was initially inspired by the show Vikings. Do you remember that documentary Vikings? Yep. I sort of really got into that for a while um, and um, it just ended up being a bit too heavy by the end of it. But um, I love the characters and I love the the, the – the, 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 you know the 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 whole efficacy of battle. I just thought that was re- I found it really intriguing, um, and I know it's not new and it's been happening since Spartan times. Um, uh, but basically, initially the the song was going to be called Green Fields because I, I, I was just kind of this idea of two two sort of uh, factions, warring tribes, uh, groups, whatever facing off and having an etiquette for battle. And each group knows exactly why they're there. They said, well, they're, they're going to have a fight. They're going to have a battle, right? And to me, that just using that as a metaphor um, in my life, obviously because I'm the person who created the song, well, I was the conduit for the song, I should probably say more accurately, but... That, that idea, the song is called You Know Why I Asked You Here. And it's that metaphorical foe or challenge that you've got that says to you, you know why I asked you here. So you've got to, you've got to stand and deliver. You've got to fight. You've got to, you've got to perform. You, whatever it is, you've got, to, you've got to sit down and you've got to do that. You've got to, you've got to do that race. You've got, to do, you've, got to, you've got to finish that song. You've got to do those things. That's, that's what it's about. And it's about the battle to do that because when you're faced with that, um, I know for me probably the most uh, the, the crystallization of that whole metaphor for me um, is uh, probably performing. I would say uh, because whenever I get to that mindset of performing, uh, it is like in my mind um, this I'll say twisted battle because I'm not there to kill anyone. I'm only there to love everyone. And share what I'm doing. Like honestly, that's that's why I'm there. But there's a, there is this thing behind that. Um, Steve Pressfield calls it the resistance, and I, I I guess to me that makes a lot of sense. It's like it's like a reckoning, and you got it. You got to turn up, and you got to commit. Whatever you're doing, whatever that is, do it. Fight. You might win. You might lose. You might play like an imbecile, but you are there giving a good account or the best account for yourself that you can and um, in any challenge that comes to you. So that's what the tune's about. Okay. So if you, if you go back from that and you go, well, what does it sound like? Well, there's a bit of there's a bit of testosterone. There's a bit of visceral energy about it. Um, there's a, It's got a bit of fury about it. Um, there's a bit of – it sounds a bit like a fight. Uh, but there's also moments of glory about it, which there's always in battle. 
metaphorical or physical battle or literal battle. Um, so uh, there's moments of dreaming in battle as well of the glory or what happens if I go, will I go to Valhalla or not? You know, <laughs> you know, it's that it's all of that sort of stuff. And there, there are sections of the song. So the main sort of groove is like this. Uh, so. And it's kind of like this really pumping sort of tom, primal tom type thing. And then it goes into this sort of... And that's sort of, so it has this drifty, flighty stuff that's quite airy, then comes back into the flight again. And then it goes into like a, almost like a break, but it's a, a still tension in the song. And then it goes through the chorus again, which is quite glorious, but not fully settled. Um, so there's plenty of drama. I cool. love drama. Cool. The other thing I love about rock and metal is drama. And I think sometimes in new metal that gets lost because it's a little bit, it's not dynamic enough. But a lot of older metal and a lot of older rock there's so much swagger and drama in what's going on. It's just totally over the top. Like, how the fuck could this happen? You know? Yeah. It's like, it's like one of those things when you're watching a watching some sci-fi or monster movie, and it's like, surely Martians couldn't pick up that car with their laser beam. It's like, what? You're talking about Martians picking up a car? Like, the whole thing's like completely <laughs> like left. It's, you know, it's a little bit like that. Like it's, so it's, It sounds to me I, like I, you've... Like you've composed a film score to a movie that's in your mind. I think, yeah. Look, most most often, um, uh, I, I get very inspired by being out in the elements. I hear a lot of music when I'm out running, um, or before I go to sleep, or sometimes even dreaming. I heard some stuff the other day. I, was, I had this dream about a friend of mine. He's really great guitar player, like beautiful guitar player, and I really admire the way he plays. He's so different to me, and. Every time he just plays one note, I go, man, that's just beautiful. You know? That's fantastic. I love it. I love the way he plays it. Yeah, thanks, bro, whatever. And, uh, and I, I had this dream where he was playing all this shit and it was so mind-blowing. I'd never heard anything like it, right? And, and then I was like, what is that you're playing? And I was literally in the dream going. <laughs> just going, that's fucking terrible. What are you doing? And he's like giggling at me in the dream. And then I woke up. I was like, oh, what a terrible dream. That was just awful. What was I doing? That, that, that is like. And, and then and then I had, and then it was like, it was like, what was I doing in that dream? What was he playing in that dream? That's the sound. That's it. And I remember when I was a kid, when I was 14, I had a dream of a guitar sound. I dreamt I was sitting down there. I've never forgotten this dream. I had a dream. I was sitting at the end of my street and. In the dream, I had a guitar and I was, there was this sound that was coming out of it. And I, and I could barely play that time, you know. You know, or a few chords, whatever. And the, but this sound was coming out of my guitar in this dream. And that is the sound that has stayed with me ever since. Wow. That, that is the sound. And the closest thing I've ever heard to that from another guitar player is uh, Eric Johnson. Yeah, that his that particularly around the Arvaya Musicom, um, Venus Isle tones that that sort of era of his violin like tone was like when I first heard that I, I was like I, I can't believe I'm hearing someone do this I heard this in a dream you yeah. know that's that sound and that was many years later yep. you know so I remember hearing clips of Dover on a guitar player do you remember the guitar player sound pages absolutely absolutely. Good I've probably that? still got I mean, a couple yeah, of those lying around. Oh man, amazing, amazing! Yeah. 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 Speaking of which, I, I brought this up with you just through Messenger the other day. I do recall seeing you in in Mike Varney's column in the back of Guitar Player magazine oh, in the spotlight. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is quite ironic. I'm actually lining up Mike Varney to come on for a chat. Um, so That's amazing, next man. couple of weeks, yeah. he, should, he should be good. I won't, I won't say um, say hi because he doesn't know who I am. But I feel like I know him. I know all of those. I used to know all of those artists like Greg oh, Howard, yeah. Richie Kotzen, and, and um, uh, of course Cacophony. When I was living in LA, Marty Friedman lived downstairs in the same block. And that demo that I sent to him, um, I took it to Marty 
first and said, could you, because I knew he was really good friends with Mike Varney and I said, you know, would you mind listening to this and just tell me if you think it's good enough to send to him yeah. and uh, to maybe get into Guitar Player magazine. And he said, uh, he's like, yeah, it was really nice. He was like, yeah, cool, man. And anyway, um, so he listened to it and he goes, yeah, it's not bad. Yeah, I reckon send it to him, you know. So I don't know if he listened to it or not, but anyway. Um, it, what, it wasn't until a fair bit later that I actually delivered something to Mike Varney, which got me into the magazine. That Actually, a lot of those tracks ended up being on my first record called Big Sky. So... So that was, they were quite good, I thought. Like the demos were quite good, all done on a Tascam 8-track cassette player. Um, and, that yeah, when I hear those sorts of things now, I go, yeah, it's a lot of young, unbridled creativity and a bit fearless there, which is good, yeah. Nice, so, nice yeah. one. Yeah. But, yeah, that was, um, that was an incredible. I remember when I got that magazine, I'd just come off the road from being in North Queensland with a band, covers band. Um, so... I was pretty shabby, I must admit, at that particular point. But I also remember not enjoying my experience that much at that particular tour that we did. Other previous ones were great fun, like the best fun ever. But I was a bit down. I was going, man, what, you know, the tour's over. What, what am I going to do? And I get home and in the letterbox is this guitar play magazine. I'm going, what's this all about? And then I've got to go and say, my heart just started racing. I still remember ripping, it, ripping the cover off and going to the spotlight column. Oh, fucking guitar player! Fucking guitar Yes. You know, to, man, to us, I don't know if you remember, but back in the day, that was the Bible. Oh, yeah. Like that, you, you would wait. It would always be four months late, but you, would, I would go to that news agent in the city working athlete's foot every day going, there's a new guitar player in. They go, nah. The next day, there's a new guitar player in. They go, nah. It would just be over, like, over and over. Then when it would finally come in, I would pour over Every word and every lesson, I read about them and these great legends of guitar who, you know, who came before, well before us, you know, just these legends that basically wrote the book and reading about them and just go, oh, my God, and then seeing this little ad, you want to get good, you want to get professional, Guitar Institute of Technology. And that's where I first saw it. That was and about a year and a half or two of seeing that in magazines before I decided to go. Yeah, I think that was the dream for a lot of people, mate, um, was to go to something like that. And, yeah. you know, I went to LA for the first time a couple of years ago and um, I was shocked. I was expecting a much bigger place. I walked past it. But yeah. um, LA was just a big shock all around, man. I remember just outside of where Musicians Institute is seeing the, the Hollywood Walk of Fame and saying to my friend, oh, so where's the real one? And he's like, ah, Nah, this is it, man. I'm like, what? Yeah. It's a wild place. Yeah. Yeah. Wild. A bit scary. Wild. Scary. Very scary. It is a scary yeah. place. Yeah. 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 Mate, yeah. you've got a new show in the works as well. Uh, yeah. Tell us about that. Yeah. So, um, so basically, I, I've been this last year, I've been on the road with a show called Good Morning Vietnam. I'm the musical director for that show, which is um, just songs from the Vietnam War era. Excellent show. It really, really great show. Um, fantastic uh, crew and cast, everything. Just, just a, a joy to be part of that. Great music, of course. Um, and the producer of that show, um, Mel Evans, who's a, a good friend of mine. We, um, she had an idea. She said, uh, you know, back before this show, she's, she's a bit of an ideas girl. She's like, you know, I've got an idea for this uh, like hard rock show. So like, what? Well, you just don't have to look any further than this, right? I am your man, you know. <laughs> All right, well, I'll get. how would you feel about becoming musical director for it? And I'm like, yeah, that'd be great. Anyway, so months went on, months went on, and we started talking about it more and more. And um, and I thought this is uh, a really great opportunity. It, how, how it ended up becoming Simon Gardner's Big Stadium Rock was talking to Mel and trying to just think about how to, um, I guess, sort of, incorporate uh, my profile into it because I knew I'd have this single coming out and if we could somehow get it, because it all kind of lines up, being like the single is hard rock, but even though it's instrumental um, and it's, it sounds great, all that sort of stuff and and h how could it line up with this? And that's uh, my name's kind of sort of synonymous with more hard rock stuff and I thought this is great. 
And she said, what about if we call it Simon, what about if we call it Big Stadium Rock Show featuring Simon Garden? Okay, well, that's a, that's a bit silly. I mean, no one's going to go to a show featuring a guitar player. And then she said, well, what about Simon Gardner's Big Stadium Rock Show? And straight away I thought that sounded really good because it sounds like I'm curating the show, which is I, I feel comfortable with that because um, I am very passionate about that music and we've got a great band and a great uh, like hot as singers, like they they are killer. Um, and I thought, yeah, this is, this is just going to be an absolute blast to play um, because we want to make it really loud, really over the top, big lighting show. It's We want it to feel like you're back there, you know, watching these big, heavy hard rock bands. So we're doing, you know, White Snake, Gunners, um, Crew, uh, Alice Cooper, you know, Aussie, just just all the great bands, Van Halen, um, of course. So it's, it's, the content is really good as well. Like there are a couple of, couple of uh, questionable tunes in there for bands like Warrant and, um, and Poison, but those guys were massive stars. They were, mate. And, There's no denying that. You know, and it's and again, sort of further to what we were saying before, like there, there was, you know, the joy of playing rock and roll live, uh, that's just, that is like, yeah, let let the dogs out. Let's go. You know, it's like, yep, let's rock and roll. So, yeah, so that um, that whole aspect of it. So, anyway, it's starting. We've, we've launched the show. We've got some dates coming up in December, in October. And um, everyone involved is super excited about it. And it's a really positive group. So, really great group of people to work with. Really professional, good players. Like I said, outstanding singers and front people, which is so important for this type um type of show um and type of music as well um so yeah just really really excited about it uh, probably more than anything else just the pure uh joy of playing loud rock and roll from an era that i grew up playing in you know um that it seems to be quite popular now i've got i had students who were 12 and 13 know who doug aldridge is from white snake wow they know who Warren D. Martini. I saw this young guy, Warren D. Martini, was his favorite guitar player, and he's twelve years old. I said, "Dude, what are you doing? Just you can't." Warren D. Martini is awesome. So yeah, I want to work out how to play this rat solo. So the first thing I've got in my mind is, "Oh fuck, it's gonna be too hard to play." <laughs> <laughs> but of course, we did it. I didn't need to do much, too, by the way, because he worked it all out himself. I mean, so he was so good. Um, That's awesome. So. Yeah, so you know, um, it seems to me that 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 from a viability point of view, it could it could work as well. So uh, yeah, we're all very excited about doing it, and and really can't get into the rehearsal room and start nutting out the sets. And uh, well, the sets are sort of we're taking care of that, but just to get together and start rocking out, it'd be great. And so nice. I'm looking forward yeah. to seeing that, mate. Looking forward. Yeah, to it. I'll yeah. make sure I'm not sure I get a ticket for you. So uh, awesome. Yeah, it'd be- Oh, yeah. Thanks, mate. So oh. you, you mentioned teaching and some of the students that, that are coming through and, and yeah. people liking that kind of music now. Um, and you said you were, you were teaching online earlier this morning. Yeah. Is that what you're mostly doing is online teaching? Yeah. or you uh, with, with, uh, mainly online and mainly um, I still teach at JMC Academy uh, two, three days a week, uh, yep. lecture and, and take guitar and ensemble there which I love, it's fantastic. Um, and, uh, but yeah, online is just, I, yeah, teach primarily online now, um, which, uh, yeah, was re- really, really good. I've had some students who were, were in in person um, who were quite reticent to come online, but they seem to, um, it, again, it's just a bit of an adaptation and the dynamic of the lesson is different. Um, the focus is much more on the student. Yeah. Um, even though, you know, it is all your lessons as a teacher should be student centric anyway, but, um, when they're when you're not there with them, you I, I find that you're constantly getting them to perform back to you what you're playing, and it, so they're really under the microscope. So it's very intensive. Yep. So they're all very productive as well. And um, so once you get used to the uh, potential impersonality about it, and you, that gets out of the way, it actually ends up being a really nice experience. It keeps you in touch with people. Um, so. Um, yeah, so I, I teach uh, teach online. You know, whoever wants lessons, pretty much. So, and, and um, how do people find you, mate? I'm just at, at uh, just on my website, Simon Garden Music, or on Messenger, on Facebook. Um, 
I'm sort of all over everything at the moment. So, yeah, easy, very easy to get in touch with, but just by my email is probably the best or messenger. Yeah. Okay, yep. So, so um, Simon, yeah. simongardermusic.com? Dot .au. Dot yeah. .au. Yeah. Awesome, yeah, awesome. Easy to find out, yeah. So, um, yeah. It man. is a new world now where you can do this kind of thing. I took a lesson oh, a few years ago now with yeah. uh, James Norbert Ivanyi. Um, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah. Melbourne gone. Uh, Sydney, Sydney, Sydney. Yeah, yeah. He's, uh, he's yeah. fantastic. Hey, I saw him online. Uh, Friedman had posted something of him, and he was just. I was like, yeah. I don't know what the fuck that is, but I'm contacting this guy, and and like you say, he didn't do that much playing. It was more playing a backing track while he sat there looking at me, going, "Hmm, yeah, try this, try that, try that," and yeah, it's amazing yeah. what could be done. Yeah. It um, I did um, I did, I did a session a couple of weeks ago with a guy, an American guy who used to be a GIT teacher called Alan Hines. Do you know him at all? No, I don't. Uh, he's a, a superb guitar player. Uh, yeah, really, his legato is unbelievable. Um, but anyway, it was awesome to talk to him, To for me, to talk to someone senior, to talk about con- conceptual things for improvisation. Just brilliant. There's, there'd be no way I'd be able to do that if it wasn't, for the paradigm that we're working in now, yeah. you know, uh, and it was just such a good experience to be able to to make contact with him easily, and meet him, and talk about this sort of stuff, you know, uh, really cool, yeah, really great. So, awesome. um, yeah, man. Great. So he even played, he even played me some of his, uh, gave me a sneak preview of some of his re- new release, and um, yeah, man, it was it was great. It was a bit zeppelin me actually. I said, fuck, man, that's awesome. <laughs> Cool, cool. Yeah, very good. So, awesome. So, yeah. I mean, I, I did say I, I can only go to about quarter past because I actually have a – I've got to go to the dentist. I I chip my tooth. Oh. It's really sharp, man. It's like stupidly yeah. sharp. Yeah. Uh, and, I, yeah, it took a couple of weeks. But we've still got about 15 minutes. So I'm going to ask you about gear. Yeah. Um, but I'm just going to let folks know – watching if anyone has any questions now's the time to drop them um because i'll come back to those in a second um but gear wise i'm assuming you've played a lot of different gear over the years yeah. what are you using these days i mean tell us about that beautiful guitar you've got in your hands yeah okay so um so i'm a like a, a local endorsee of ibanez guitars so um uh i have a really great relationship with ibanez or australis here in australia um and um yeah so uh, I thought for the show, for the big rock show, I wanted to get a really special guitar that popped um, visually, but was a really fine guitar as well. Uh, now, I've had this guitar here for a long time as well. I just happened to have it handy. Um, so this guitar here, my seven string, is a J Custom Old Universe uh, from 2005, which um, I bought from Guitar Brothers, uh, I don't know, a few years ago. I think it's Ben McGregor. I don't know if you know Ben McGregor, but I think... no. Very, very cool guitar player. Um, he, uh, this used to be his, but anyway, um, the, I recorded a lot of my record, and so it goes with that guitar, my Les Paul. Anyway, I was, I'm so blown away and enamored with that guitar, the way it's aged, and also the frets on it that only, you can only get with the J Custom guitars, or that's what it seems. And so I thought, I, I, I thought I'd go for something like this one here. With this, I'm a bit of a fan of blue guitars, so, and this this color is cool. Um, Royal Sapphire Blue. So wow, it had the Royal in it, which I really like. Um, had the Sapphire, and, uh, of course I love that, and Blue. So I thought, even the name, I'll have to get that guitar. So uh, it's it's superb. It's really really good. It's, it's incredibly dark. Uh, it's much darker than my Les Paul tone wise, um, but it has it has those J Custom frets, and even though it's an RG with the skinny wizard neck. The J Custom necks, they're just a little bit deeper because I find this the, the Wizard necks just a little bit too thin. But the J Custom necks, just a little bit, I don't know. They say it's the same, but it doesn't feel the same. It feels different. Um, so, yeah, so Ibanez is definitely high on my agenda. I love my Les Paul. Um, and for this new single, in the, when you see, I was talking about Adrian Golby before. He shot a playthrough for me, which, which I'll release next later next week. Um, a video playthrough, and he took that the really nice photos that um, I've got up on my website at the moment. Um, and uh, I've got a Mark V boogie head and um, 
two by twelve cab amp. The whole the whole single was recorded with that amp, so no direct no sims on that one. So everything's nice. yeah, really really good. And that was a cha- again a challenge I'd sort of set for myself um, because as good as the sims sound, it seemed to me that there is a real sound to them. Mm. Um, uh, what that is quantifiably is difficult to explain. Again, talking about sounds, but the way the best way I could sort of describe it is they sometimes just sound a little bit two dimensional, even though they're really good. They're just a little bit two dimensional. That's why I was asking about the neural DSP. If you'd used it and if what you thought of it, because I've heard that they're pretty amazing. Adrian was telling me about it, and um, but there's something about playing again this amp thing. The way it buzzes and the way that makes all these noises and it's dirty, it's like a bit of an animal sitting over there I'm looking yeah. at. Um, well, I really like that. There's something very attractive about that and yeah. the way it responds to the way I play is very different that I just don't get from the Sims. I don't get that response. And yeah. I don't and the way it's coming through a guitar cabinet, you know. So so yeah, so Mesa, I love Mesa. Um, for the big stadium rock show though, contrary to that, I, because those, a lot of those sounds are very hot rod heavy Marshall vibe. Um, I might have to use the, uh, the Fractal X8 for that or get a Marshall JVM, I think. Could, have you used the JVMs at all? Have you? No, demoed? no. Man, I'll be, I'll be really honest with you. Um, I'm not a fan of anything Marshall made after about 85. There's yeah, okay. just a scratchiness about the sounds that. Yeah my ears don't agree with and I, and I I can't say I've played all the different models out there but just my experience in recording a lot of bands over the years was anytime they brought in an older JCM 800 or a JCM 900 or anything after that there was just a scratchiness about it um I had a friend that lent me his 30th or 35th anniversary the four channel oh, yeah. purple thing same oh, deal yeah. man there was just that scratchiness that I Tend to yeah. go searching for in EQs to to get rid of. I had a six thousand one hundred for a while. Um, I've had a few Marshalls TSL one hundreds. I don't know how many of those I've had. Fuck, I buy and sell them. Um, but the um, six thousand one hundred I had for a while. The the clean channel and the middle channel on that were superb. They they were. But the third channel was not very nice at all. It was like uh, almost unusable. But the first two channels were really uh, they were pretty impressive. Yeah, but. Um, yeah, so I'm thinking I might use the Fractal for the big rock show to get those overblown sounds, which I can't – I don't think – to get that out of my Mark V, it's got to be strapped and it's going to blow – again, it's going to kill some child in the audience or blow up the drum kit. Um, so so will you be cut, running that yeah. through a cab on stage? Um, that's my optimal – my optimal scenario would be to have in-ears, um, but I don't have any yet. Um, so if not, I'll take like my QSC, like a – like a flat response speaker and um, take that in in there and use that. But then again, it, it's I don't – I'll lose myself if I'm running around the stage yeah. and I'll go to the other side of the stage, which happens sometimes uh, without having any, any monitoring, especially playing a lot of that stuff where you need to hear what you're doing because, the you know, it's, it's challenging guitar stuff. So um, – yeah, so I'm not sure, but so it's it's yeah. my opinion, and it's just purely my opinion that yeah. um, you need that sound coming off a, a cab on stage if you're a punter down the front. And I've had some guitar players I on agree. here that I that I seriously admire, man, um, and they're all telling me about how great the the new Axe FX three is, and and I'm 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 thinking to myself, I, I don't want to say it, but I was right down the front at your concert. You know, a few few months back, and the vibe just wasn't happening on stage. You know, the guitars were coming out from the PA out out there, but I'm here, and I remember seeing you guys back in the day where I'd be listening to the sound, the stage sound, and that's just not yeah. happening anymore these days. I did oh, go to the Red man, Hot man. Summer Tour recently, and I was right down the front as I usually do, and there yeah. were on stage rigs. There was a back line that people were playing through, and the first yeah. really good guitar sound I heard was John Stevens' guitar player playing through oh, yeah. Kemper. But then he had he was going through a cab yeah. on stage, and yeah. so yeah, I kind of miss that, and I yeah, do totally yeah. get. I mean, I've got a I got a Kemper stage, I think they're called, sitting right here. Yeah. Let's see yeah. if people can see that. Yep, yeah, there's one right there. Um, great for direct. Man, when I take a an out of that to run to my cabs, I've got a couple of 
four by twelve sitting right here, as everybody should in their lounge room. Um, and I come out of the monitor out. Oh, this, oh, it sounds great direct. Going through my cabs, not so much. Yeah, yeah, there's full range solutions. I've tried that. Am I just a picky motherfucker? <laughs> yeah, I think it should be. I think it should be with your tone. But I think you've also got to be realistic that it's never going to be the same in any venue. I reckon that that is probably the biggest mistake we make. Um, and the other thing too is blaming your gear for bad tone because if you look at your gear, it won't change on a day-to-day basis. <laughs> Whereas I think the only variable here is the, the operator, you know. Like yeah. It's not, yeah. But um, I, I, I agree with you 100% that you need to have that resonance on stage. You need to, and even talking to Jim, um, Jim, the drummer in, uh, he uses in-ears, and um, he's like, even even like when I've got in-ears, I still like to hear your amp on stage because yeah. it gives me the resonance. Yeah. Whereas when you, go, when you go direct, it's not quite as powerful. It just doesn't fill. So, so well, there you go. I'm just going to have to buy something else then. Maybe no money. Dude, Maybe I should start play through the boogie and go, guys. Can you give me an amp because I recorded this whole thing with your Mark V that doesn't work properly. Well, they're in the hands of Gibson these days, mate. So you'd have to be, That's it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah no, no. Um, you know, I, I did a show recently where we had another guitar player guesting with us, and he had a Helix, and I remember he was raving online about how good it all sounded. And I just took my iPad and I was using a twenty dollar um, app. Uh, yeah. Bi- bias effects. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I might be biased, but I think my tone was better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's all down to the operator. I tuned those sounds through my NS10s behind me here, and which I've mixed everything on. That's what I listen to all my music on. So yeah. I really got a, a strong point of reference. And yeah. that's one thing I've, I've come to realize watching a million demos of all the gear is it, they – will all sound good in the hands of the right person. They'll sound incredibly yeah. shit in the hands of the wrong person. There's some people yeah. that just need an amp with one knob that says volume. Yeah. And then there's other people that can have a million knobs and switches to play with and know yeah. what a good guitar sound is in their head in order yeah. to, to chase it. Oh, definitely. That's a that's a d- dead dead right. Yeah, dead right. It, it is about finding what's right for you and then work. You, but you do have to work your tone. You know, yep. there's a lot of work that has to go into it. Um, but, uh, yeah, at the end of it, it always comes back to finger on string and it starts there and we'll come back to that, you know. So, but I, I love my X8 because of its flexibility, just the same as your Kemper. Like I can, I, I do love the four cable method with my boogie. Yep. And um, that's a great, a great setup actually because the effect, the quality of the, just the raw effects in the X effects are, are beautiful. And when you pair them with a, 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 an amp like the boogie, it's uh, just killer. So, nice. Yeah, yeah, really yeah. nice. So, so yeah, so probably for the big stadium rock show, I'll, I'll use this, and for the playthrough, for you know why I asked you here, I use this guy in the boogie as well, um, and um, yeah, so that's kind of kind of sets me up for for good now. But to be honest, man, I and I said this on my last the last record I did, Inside Goes, it, whatever it took for me to get the sound I could hear in my head or as close to that as possible, I would just use. So I use GT10, I use Les Pauls, I use I use uh, Strats, I use Ibanez 7 string. Whatever it took to get the sound I could hear, then I just go with that. I, I'm not definitely not one of these guys who will go, you have to use IRs or your Axe effects won't sound any good or you have to do this and it's not going to sound any good. You know, that's all bullshit. What sounds good is exactly what you're saying. Like, it's about you and your vision for what you want. So I totally, totally get that. So yeah. You know, I've given people my presets that I use on my little iPad setup and they think, yeah, yeah that's the, the magic bullet. And they've come back with their tail between the legs going, man, everyone in the band just fucking looked at me and just went, that just sounds like fucking <laughs> shit. And it's like, what, what gives? So well, firstly, yeah. I tell whoever's doing sound, set my monitors flat straight up and I have enough of a knowledge of sound that I can play one chord and just say to them, dude, Give me a big scoop at 500 back about 3 yeah. dB um, yeah. to tune it to those monitors. Um, and secondly, it's it's all in your hands, man. I, I always laugh. Dave Leslie said to me one time, they were touring opening for Def Leppard. 
Yeah. And yeah. Vivian Campbell walks past uh, his dressing room and sticks his head in and he says to him, to Dave, man, you, your set sounded great. Your tone was amazing. And I was about to ask you what gear were you, you, you were using. But we all know, tones in the hands. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I think it was a story about Eddie Van Halen and Ted Nugent. Like Ted Nugent was, um, I th- I'm thinking it was uh, Ted Nugent. So the story goes anyway. So Ted Nugent and Eddie Van Halen are hanging out at a sound check or something. You can imagine what happened there. Um, and uh, Ted Nugent gives Eddie his one of his bird lands, you know, yep. through, the, through these ple- dime plexis. And it just sounds like Eddie playing his solid body piece of junk through his. Through his um, through his modern plexus, you know, yep. um, and that's, it's all. It's it, Billy Gibbons talks about that as well. Yeah, you know, about yep. that. it's all in your hands. And um, absolutely, uh, I think we know that intrinsically. I think we're externalizing. You know, when we want new gear and all that sort of stuff, it's really externalizing our own insecurities. Like I, I, used, I was terrible at it. I'm definitely better these days. But you know, whenever I find myself really lusting after new gear, I have now have to develop this voice in my head that says. Just do more fucking practice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yeah. do more practice, and yeah. um, and uh, and usually that desire to get more gear it goes away. The more you I know, practice. funny that. <laughs> I, I was. We talked earlier about you know faking country licks, and it just it isn't right unless you've grown up playing that. I've heard yeah. country guys try and play ACDC style rock, which yeah. I think is probably my my forte, and they go to play a big E chord, and it just doesn't have that pang that it does when i hit it and i'm there's a feeling i know when i do it right yeah. if there's a certain feeling under my fingers that i get where yeah. i can just feel that authority of yeah. smashing the, the e and the b strings as part of that stroke in such a way that you've really hit it but in a controlled hit that it's not going out of tune but yeah no, that's that takes a, yeah. a long time oh, that's no, no, definitely yeah that that is uh yeah that uh that throatiness that you get and and again yeah the each style has its its nuances and it's um you know you, it's that it's that audiation it's being it's being able to hear what you're about to play before you play it and to know how that should sound to you in your ears and that's yeah. you know that type of sound and the 80s stuff is the same the 70s stuff is the same i love the way that there are so many kids now when i say kids you know 20 year olds or whatever that i see uh, who are into psychedelia stuff and into 70s stuff and they play like it yeah because they, they they listen to it and they hear that sound and they they make that sound and uh that whole thing that 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 audiation thing is just huge that is that is such a massive thing for Absolutely. right across the board you know so yeah, yeah. so I mean, i've got a couple of questions there mate before i round round things yeah, up yeah. Sure, uh sure. There's one there. Firstly, is a question to me, which I will answer very quickly. Rick, where yeah. can I get a cool hat like you're wearing? Everyone <laughs> likes my my cat beanie. Let me reach around here and find. <laughs> my friend had this glass head at home, and when I put glasses on it, oh my god, it actually looks like me. So, oh. as you can see, I actually have several of these beanies. Um, they are three or four dollars each. I've got maybe four of them, um, and I get them at, there's a place at Rabina Town Centre, and it's a, like a Japanese department store, Daiko, D-A-I-K-O was the name of the shop. They're about four bucks each. Go, go, I should sell them on my website, on my um, YouTube channel. By golly, that's what I'm going to do. Okay, now the serious stuff. Um, Michael Dolce says... Yeah. And for people that don't know, Michael Dolce is the guitar player on uh, The Voice Australia and just a nice chap. Um, so, uh, Dolce says, Simon is such a great player and a beautiful human. So, oh, it's just a love fest, isn't it? I'm going to ask the most original question. What gauge strings do you use and what's your go-to drive pedal? Oh, my God. Michael Dolce asking me a question. Well, Michael, you are, you know, Michael is yeah. He's amazing, so, isn't he? Yes. So I've had right. him on for a chat if anybody wants to go back through the playlist. Michael Dolce yeah. is definitely in there. Uh, it was a great chat. I love you too, Michael. I think you're very beautiful and an amazing guitar player um, and professional. Um, so what strings? Um, <laughs> I can't believe you asked me that. But anyway, 9 to 42 um, of the Elixir OptiWebs. They're my new favourite string. I've been using them for a while now. And um, I go to drive pedal. Oh, I really don't have one. I usually use just amp gain. Um, but if I if if 
if I was to say there is a pedal that I put in front of it, it's just going to be like a basic sort of tube screamer uh, type idea. Um, just to, to tight again, with the boogie to sort of bring it in, tighten it up, because the boogie tends to be a bit airy, which I love, and a bit a bit hairy, but having that just that tube screamer or something like that just to, to tighten it up. But, again, not big on pedals, not – like I love the axe effects and I love all that stuff, but I don't, I don't know too much about those things unless I'm chasing a specific sound. But yeah, mate, I, I'll uh, just chime in with my two cents on that. I'm much the same. I prefer the amp gain of, of a good, uh, a good tube amp, but um, I'm more inclined to use a clean boost. Is something that I've come across in oh, yeah. in recent years. Um, I was very surprised when I started doing the Brian May thing when I was playing in the Queen show. Using a treble booster, firstly, the, the magic that brought to using a, a Vox style amp, which is normally very yeah. loose and farty when you crank the, the game. But yeah. um, you asked me off air earlier what my favorite amp is, and I said the Friedman Small Box. Now, the plexi channel on that cranked is Malcolm Young Heaven. Yeah. Uh, and I've got several clean boosts, which I put in front of that, which, yeah, rather than using an overdrive, just gives me more without changing the tone. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The only thing with pedals I've found is just that compression. Like I love, I love, I really love the dynamic aspect of the amp and the way the front end will compress um, depending on what guitar you're using. And sometimes just with that extra pedal. But again, with the new rock show, I'm probably going to need more gain because I, I guess over time, I don't know about you, do, but I've, I've actually I've used less and less gain. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, I think because. I feel like I need to get that that out of my hands more than the amp. Yeah. So, so much so that when I use too much gain, I just I can't play, or I can't hear anything. And yep. It's too compressed. There's no dynamic range. So. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm. Uh, just one more question before we wrap things up, mate. Uh, from Brady, if you could have any guitar player in the world make a guest appearance on your next track, who would you choose? Oh wow. Um. Uh, Oh, I don't know. God, that's a real, that's impossible. Qu- impossible. It is, isn't it? Okay, so it all depends on the track. Uh, of course, really, I'd probably have Jimmy Page. Um, oh, he's sloppy. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, I, I only, only so I could possibly meet him. Um, uh, oh, man, that's in, impossible. Um, well, I'm, I'm good. I've already invited Michael Dolce to play on a track, which I haven't recorded yet, Michael. I haven't forgotten about it, but... It will happen because um, Michael's a, a, just a beautiful guitar player. Um, oh, I don't know, man. God. Uh, how do you go? Uh, Joe Bonamassa. I don't know. Um, Jimi Hendrix, Eddie Van Halen. Um, I don't know, man. That's such a Brady. That is such a hard question. But I'd say let's just rest on Jimmy Page, the overlord. Nice. Yeah. Nice one. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. But uh, that's hard. I tell you, who I've been listening to really quickly recently, who I, who I, who I've loved, but not known. I've loved as much as I have until I've listened to his stuff. Is John Paul Jones? Um, just early releases of his from early two thousands. There's an album he did called Thunder Thief, and um, just the compositions and his use of modal harmony on that and whole tone stuff, Liddy Dominant stuff, which I love that type of harmony. Um, yeah, just very, very unusual. But that's John Paul Jones, man. I read an interview with him, and he's like, I'm like, I want to meet that guy one day. I mean, that's a life goal. You know, what an amazing individual, you know. So cool, so intelligent, such an artist, you know. Amazing. Awesome. So, awesome. Yeah. Well, Simon, I'm going to wrap things up, mate. But um, yeah. I'd really love to have you back on sometime, mate, if you're up for it. Oh, man, we should do a live jam. That's what we should do. You know, I've been looking into how to do that because of the whole latency thing. But yeah. ooh, I was talking to somebody recently and they said it was Nilly Brosh when I had her on last week and she oh, said yeah. she jammed wow. with Herman Lee live on oh, Twitch. Yeah. I'm going to put the feelers out as to how they did that without having yeah. the whole latency uh, issue because that would be a good thing just to get some of the uh, my past guests on for a little five-minute jam on something. Yeah, man. But um, next time I'm going to have batteries for – this <laughs> well, hopefully next time hopefully next time the show is up and running and i've got another new i've already got a couple other singles in the pipeline um so um yeah hopefully i've got some more an album i'll have an album ready for you so yeah nice one 
Well, mate, thank you for your, for your time this morning and I uh, hope you have a really nice day. Folks, if you enjoyed this, please like, subscribe, all that kind of stuff. Um, I mean, I've got something cool going on here, but people just don't seem to know about it. I don't, I'm not really getting the uh, the views and the, the subs just yet, but that'll take time. Um, you, Simon, people can find you, simongardner.com.au. Uh, yes, Simon Gardner Music, yeah, simongardnermusic.com.au Simon or Music. Facebook, Facebook or Messenger uh, or whatever. And, uh, yeah, check out my new single. It's coming out next week, and uh, there'll be some YouTube action late next week. Um, so, yeah. Enjoy. Awesome, awesome, mate. How 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 far away are you, are you from your camera? How far am I? Uh, I can you know, like uh, reach out and get your finger up close to it? Because you can hit the button for me, which hits the screen. Ready, set, bye. <laughs> <laughs>